Now, here's the question, though. Here's the question. How is that special bond made? Well, I'm absolutely standing by that this is an empty object at the point at which object.create is, ret uh, is returning that empty object. I stand by that, uh, that claim. But, 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 it is an empty object with a special hidden property. Now, it's not like our uh, double square bracket scope property that we can't see. We can't dot, you know, dot a uh, console log. This is what we can see. If we were to console log our new user object and press a little down arrow, we see a bunch of hidden properties. One of them is double underscore proto double underscore. There it is, underscore proto underscore, which is, let's do it in pink, underscore proto underscore, which is a bond. It's a hidden property. We have to console log news and then press the down arrow to see in the console to see the hidden properties. One of them is double underscore proto. And when we declare our empty object using the object.create uh, technique, which we know just creates empty object, but it gets this hidden property, underscore proto, underscore, to whatever we passed in, which was user function store a bond up to user function store. And that doesn't go away. So attack will to return that object out into user one, you return it out into user one, the output of user creator, return out to user one, it still has that underscore proto underscore bond to user function store. There it is, that underscore proto underscore bond. So what happens is JavaScript has a built-in feature called the prototype chain, meaning when I run user1.increment and I go and look for user1.success and I don't find increment as a method, a function on it, I don't panic. JavaScript is automatically not going to give up when it looks for something on an object and doesn't find it because it's going to go to that little underscore proto underscore and see what's there. Ah, User function store. Hmm, interesting. Let's go and see what's in there. Ah, and there's our increment function ready to go. And then we create an execution context with it. And this same function would also be available to, we're not going to run through it the whole way, but what would we, looking at our code there, what would we think user2 is going to have stored in it after calling user creator with Tim five, uh, Tim and five, Lewis? Have the proto. Well, what's the overall thing? What is our overall thing? It's an thing? object that has the property name assigned to Tim and yep. the property a score assigned to five. Perfect. So we just we skipped over the running of the user creator function and said when we call user creator, its return value will be this object here stored in user two. We didn't walk through the entire execution context, but it was happening, of course. What does this guy also have attached? Well, what's the, the hidden property? Yep. Underscore. The underscore proto underscore hidden reference to user function store. There it is. So I could also run user2. User2 dot increment. Let's do it. Talk me through the process Z if I run user2 dot increment. You're going to first look in memory for user2. Perfect. And you see that there is no increment function there. Perfect. You go to proto, which takes you to the user function store and find, find increment function there. Perfect. And I take that code and I'm going to make an execution context in which to run it. All right. So when I do that, in I go. This increment function clearly needs to be usable on whatever object I run it on. And what that means is I need some placeholder inside of that function, increment, in order to refer to that object. Whether it's user2 when I run increment on user2 or user1 when I run increment on user1. Not, I need to be able to refer to that object somehow from inside, increment. I need a default label that's always going to refer to the object in which I'm running the function. 
Can anyone tell me what that label is, Skylar? The this keyword. The this keyword, exactly. I'm going to have the this keyword by default. Here's our fundamental rule. Always pointing to the relevant object to the left-hand side of the dot on which I'm calling this function. The object to the left-hand side, I'm calling increment on the right-hand side of the user to object, and therefore, inside of the execution, execution context, the this will be automatically bound to, set to, user2. And so now I can make sure I can refer to the exact object that I want to refer to, and my increment function is nicely general. It can be used on any object, it's, because I've only got one copy of it. So it needs to be usable on all objects that have been returned out of user creator. So what is our line of code inside increment, uh, Skylar? To access the score keyword of this value. Uh -huh. Increment it. So this dot, exactly. So what is the this dot score plus plus going to evaluate to, Philip? User2 dot uh -huh. score plus plus. User2 dot score plus plus. Now, where is user2? If I look in my local memory, is that user2? No. no. So actually, it's not going to find, it's going to skip one out, find user2, find the score property, increment it to 6. Beautiful. My increment function has become truly general, but I had to use this, this, this built in this keyword. That's going to, here's our first rule for it. We're going to see another rule for it in a minute. Our first rule for it is it will always point to, always refer to, the object to the left hand side of the dot on which that function method is being called. That execution context is being called to the right hand side of an object in which we refer to the method on the, <laughs> to the object on the left using the dot. This relationship here, the this is going to be bound to the object on the left hand side of the dot. That is our fundamental rule. We're going to see another way that this keyword works quite differently in a moment on one of our later solutions. But look, our first solution has been very successful. We've used the prototypal nature through this underscore proto underscore bond. Note, by the way, this does not say prototype. This user function store is technically known as the prototype of user2, the prototype of user1. But look at where the bond is stored. It's not stored in something called prototype. We're going to see a different property in solution 3 called prototype. Very unhelpful in my view, but this bond is stored in something called underscore proto underscore. And we've used that feature to be able to achieve our fundamental goal. But look now, there's no problems with this guy. This is a beautiful solution. It's super efficient as well. Man, we have, do we have any copies of increment stored on user one and user two? None. Instead, we have one single copy of that function and other functions we have as many, many as we want in here and we can refer to them using this prototypal feature that means JavaScript knows to always go check the proto and see what's there. And by the way, look how easy it is for us to add functions up here, which will then be accessible to all the objects, even if we add them later on in that code, rather than having individual copies of every function on individual objects. Very, very inefficient. OK, beautiful. Thumbs on this second approach. You lost me. I'm clear. I have clarifications. All right, everybody, thumbs up. This is a beautiful solution. This is a beautiful solution, in my opinion. No problems. It is efficient, maybe a little bit long-winded. Once you start thinking in terms of wrapping your data and the relevant functionality in objects, you do it for everything. Even if there's only ever going to be one instance of it, like a, a game board on which you play the game, there's only one game board, maybe, running at a time, you still end up producing it as an object returned from a function, you return it as an object with the relevant functionality for the game board and the data of the game board bundled up together. So once you start thinking in object-oriented style, you do it for everything. And so creating the object inside by hand, creating the object inside and then making the bond to the function store by hand and returning it out by hand. In other languages, we don't have to do that all by hand. In other languages, all that is handled for us automatically. We get the chance to do that automatically in JavaScript as well, using something, well, using a keyword that we're going to insert here. 
oh, what could it be? <laughs> <laughs> what could it be? And this keyword is going to automate so... It's going to... I say automate. It's going to, behind the scenes, insert so many of these pieces for us. What is that keyword, do we think, Z, that we... which we insert to get all this superpower? I think it's new. It's a new keyword. I'm glad you got that right. I got nervous for a second. It's a new keyword. The new keyword is going to automatically... The new keyword, we call this, by the way, the object... The, the, the function that returns objects is called the constructor function. It constructs objects. The inserting the new keyword is going to automate multiple things. One, it's going to automate the creation of this new use, this new object. It's going to automate that for us. This is all going to be handled by, by the new keyword insertion. Everything in red is we don't have to write anymore. It's going to do all of this for us, everything in red. And it's going to return the, the new user object. Everything's going to be handled for us automatically with the new keyword. OK. We're going to see who can spot immediately what this might do. Uh, it automates a lot of our manual work. It automates the creation of the object. So, uh, and then it automates the returning of the object as well into user one just by inserting this new keyword. The new keyword just basically does a bunch of stuff inside this execution context for us. Who can see though how this might require a little bit of rethinking of how we write the code inside of this function? Philip? I'm just curious on how we're going to create the bind, the underscore, underscore proto. Oh, uh, okay. How are we going to? Make the, the uh, bind, make a link to the user function store. Yeah, because yeah, we did that manually, right? By declaring our object using object.create and passing in function store, we made a bond to that function store. Okay, so somehow we need to make a bond to a shared function store. Well, Java's going to make that bond for us. Well, that raises the question do we get to set what that fu where that function store is? Do we get to call it something? Or does JavaScript instead? choose a place for us to have these shared functions stored, and we've got to just use it. Well, it turns out it chooses a place for us, and we've just got to use it. OK, we'll see that in a moment. What's another challenge that we or at least are rethinking that's required in terms of the internals of this function now that we're manually, no, now we're no longer manually declaring new user is an object, add the property name to new user object. Mijun, what can you see? So we're not going to have new user uh, available to us anymore right. as a label. Our object is being made for us automatically. So we can't refer to it anymore the way we were before as new user dot name. Instead, we're going to have to refer to it. Jobs is going to give us a default label for it. Lewis, what's the default label it's going to fall back on? This. This. <laughs> Very different this to the one we saw earlier inside of increment, where it was referring to the object at the calling of that method. This is a totally different use of the keyword this. The this here refers to the auto-created object inside of the user creator function because we use a new keyword. It's going to automatically create an object and give it the label this. All right. We're going to walk through this all line by line. But it's going to require one other thing for us to understand before we move on. A funny old notion. Oh, man. This is a funny thing. How JavaScript thinks about functions as both objects and functions. Oh, man. This is funny. OK. So we're going to come back to all of this in a second. But to understand, First thing I said is we do not get to set that our functions are the shared functions that all the objects that get returned out of running user creator each time all get access to through the proto reference. We don't get to set it as user function store anymore, or function store we call it here. We don't get to set that anymore. That's done automatically for us. So JavaScript says, you know, you don't get to set it, I'm going to put them in a default place. Well, I'm going to expect you to put those shared functions in a default place. Probably an object, right? So we could put a bunch of functions as properties on object. Where would that be? Where could I put where is that going to be? Well, it's going to take advantage of a funny old property of JavaScript, which we saw in callbacks and hardware functions. That all functions in JavaScript are actually really just objects that can have properties on them like any other object. Let's see that with uh, our favorite functions.